Welcome to Geeks and Jocks, a podcast that focuses on video games, film, television, and sports. And now, for the person who is in charge of this podcast, here is Ryan Sullivan. Hi, and welcome back to Geeks and Jocks. It made it to episode 15. I can't believe it myself, you know. Sure, I only get a few people here on YouTube, but you know what? I like doing them, even if it means something to those few people. So, got a couple things to talk about. Nintendo and their uh, usual complaints on fan projects. Uh, Marvel Avengers making a huge debut, making over a billion, I might add. And the NFL Draft to, um, to say a few things regarding the first round. So I guess I'll begin the first thing with Nintendo. So for those wondering, over the past week or so, um, there was a guy that worked on this project for the last seven years in making a port of the original Super Mario Brothers for the Commodore 64 computer. Now for those wondering, what is a Commodore 64? It's an early 80s computer from 1982 it ran for a very long time lasted well over a decade ended around 1994 so roughly around when Commodore filed for bankruptcy it is one of the most popular computers of all time it had a ton of games sure some of the stuff might have been downgraded to fit onto the hardware but hey it was a big deal such a huge deal it's like if you were to look at some of the best Commodore computers, it would probably come down to that and the Amiga. The Amiga doing a lot of things that you wouldn't think otherwise. And pretty comparable to DOS computers of the late 80s and early 90s. But this, the title screen from what I looked at looked very impressive. It definitely looks a little different from the NES game, but it looks pretty good. And I need to find video of it if there's still any up there because... One of the difficult things with computers up until 1990 with Commander Keen is the fact that scrolling a game was next to impossible. There might have been a few before that, before Commander Keen, because it, the way Commander Keen was, it, it was able to, thanks to John Carmack, by the way, being able to figure out a way to make the game scroll without needing to go left to right, boom, next scene, go left to right, boom, next scene, and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the scrolling is at the very least decent for Super Mario Brothers, but unfortunately Nintendo issued a cease and desist of a DMCA takedown digital millennium copyright act, and so more than likely the big sites that have the ROM and all that probably don't have it anymore and it just goes to show how much incompetence uh, Nintendo has with with understanding the retro community and all that and it, it, it just, it's really the pigheadedness of their executives in Japan and all that and all the people over there because the retro community is fueled by homebrews it, there's a lot of homebrews for various systems and stuff like that. One of the most prominent consoles to get a lot, the Atari Jaguar. That system was one of the most ill-fated systems ever, despite lasting only three years and about maybe 60 games altogether, about 50 for the Jaguar itself and for its ill-fated, even more ill-fated CD add-on, uh, about 13 games, so a little over 60. There are more homebrew games than the Jaguar library itself. There's a lot of love for the homebrew community there. And actually, there's quite a bit of love for the uh, homebrew community regarding Atari systems. I mean, they there are like there's like Mario Brothers on the uh, Super Mario Brothers to be exact uh, on on the Atari 2600. Someone did a Halo game for the 2600 in 2010. You don't see that. Who in their right mind does Halo for one of the oldest video game systems ever? I'll tell you what, there you'll be surprised at what people can do with certain things. And there's also that phenomenon, can it run Doom? Can certain machines run the first-person shooter game of 1993? 
and there's been various game systems that have done it, ATMs, various objects that are capable of playing Doom. You'd be surprised at what people can do. But, yeah, I mean, like, one of the things that has been cool with, like, stuff like the Atari is, like, and older systems before the NES is having better versions via homebrew, like a much more cleaner Pac-Man for the 2600, Donkey Kong looking better on the Intellivision, a complete version for like, you know, it was either like ColecoVision or Intellivision, I forget, but people want to enjoy a good experience on some of these older systems. And of course, you got some of the NES and up, you know, one of the biggest communities for fan-made games is the Sonic the Hedgehog games. And that leads to what another thing, Sonic Mania, because proof of concept from Christian Whitehead for bringing a port over of Sonic CD to to other systems, I mean, to modern systems to be exact. And Sega liked the idea and they gave him permission to do the game. And prior to that, there had only been a couple ports of the game to other systems. It was originally on the Sega CD in the fall of 93. It came out on Windows 95 three years later. No ports until 2005 with Sonic Gems Collection for the GameCube, and those were emulated games, I believe. Well, at least the GameCube version. And when the uh, PS3 and 360 versions came out, it was an entirely it was built from the ground up, and it did a lot of things differently compared to the other versions and even the original. And that led to Whitehead doing versions of Sonic 1 and 2 for like iOS and of course Sonic Mania which with his engine I mean it's it's phenomenal for doing a 2D type engine that can have the capabilities of what 32-bit systems could do and that just shows how dedicated communities are to this kind of stuff I mean there are tons of games that you could probably find and you won't have a tough time uh, figuring out what ones are good, which ones are bad, you know, I mean, the PC, for, good, for goodness sake, I mean, it has a great modding community, and that's how I've managed to play a number of mods to Doom and a couple other games, that's, but it's just, the way Nintendo is, it just shows, as I said, the incompetence of them and the pigheadedness of, of them in regarding these kind of projects. I mean, they've shut down a number of them over the past probably 10 years or so. And people have done like a Metroid remake and just the they did they just don't understand the retro community. I mean, after all, these are the guys that that ultimately shut down a few emulation sites that that carried a number of their games just because oh, they have Pokémon for the Game Boy and all that. And it's like it, it just, it, are people really going to be upset that Pokemon can be downloaded for free? The Game Boy versions, Game Boy Color and all that. I, I don't think any, most of them will. I don't think it's that big of a deal for games that are not the you know Switch only or 3DS and all that. It's not going to make them lose that much money. That's just one of the things I just don't get out of it. I mean, these I mean these games are very old and like regarding Super Mario Brothers, it is one of the most common games of all time. I mean, you could probably find a copy for the NES somewhere along with Duck Hunt. You could probably find a version of the Game Boy Color port and it, it you wouldn't have a hassle to find it in stores it just it just makes no sense I mean it's plus it's on a fucking Commodore computer you need like the hardware well at least the emulation hardware for the Commodore 64 the system is 37 years old and to be upset about a 33 going on 34 year old game I understand it's on Virtual Console, eShop, all that crap, but is it really going to kill your sales 
is it really going to kill anything? And it just makes it just makes having to find Nintendo stuff even more difficult because it just and I'm going back to the emulation thing, it's just you it's frustrating. It's just very frustrating because it's like not everyone has the money to to go on and buy a handful of games that go for very high prices and for them shutting down places like Emu Paradise which was very secure and you need to venture yourself into other places where you could get viruses and stuff like that and just it just bothers me a lot that's all I'm gonna say regarding that it just I just think this is a, just another stupid move from Nintendo and just another way to to disappoint their fans and they wonder why they are constantly belittled at times and why for every step they do forward they take a few steps back speaking of games I've been playing a few games on PS4 lately and I actually went through all of Hitman for the for the system and it was for free f a couple months ago and I took a chance on it because I've never I never played a Hitman game in my life never have and so to play it and I got used to it pretty quickly and the idea of the game is to assassinate people via stealth and various ways without getting caught but the, I mean, and I like that it has that style but I also like that I can also just kill everyone in the game I mean it, you do you do not um, do well in terms of scores if you uh, kill everyone your score will be zero I'm surprised they didn't have negatives for that <laughs> but you can play it any way you want but definitely the stealth method is what they prefer which no surprise really <laughs> graphically it looked great for being an early 2016 game it has a lot of content in there a lot of escalation stuff you can do featured contracts that people have created themselves you can create your own contracts I don't mind the voice acting it, it's definitely hilarious when when others react it's like wait a minute and just and just people saying I don't want to die and all that <laughs> uh, but very solid game maybe a little cheap in some spots but other than that it was very good and the last last few days or so I've gotten back into playing this time travel type game called uh, Life is Strange. It was, I think it was free a couple of years ago, but I never had, got the chance to, to download it because I did not have a PS Plus account, and plus it was in June of 2017, which is when I got my PS4, so I didn't really have a chance to download it, but it was cheap. It usually goes for discount prices at times throughout the year and it was so far gone through three episodes and I like what I've seen so far because I love the concept of time travel one of my all-time favorite movies and maybe my all-time favorite 80s movie is the first back to the future I just love the time travel aspect of it and how it affects certain things in the timeline and with life is strange it it's one of those things it's like I've never seen the butterfly effect but I hear it has a lot of it has some correlations that are similar to it and it almost comes off to me at times like a Twilight Zone episode too because I know there's an episode that centers around freezing time but the the game it looks great graphically it's not pushing anything as far as capabilities go but then again it was on older systems like the PS3 and the 360 as it did come out at first in early 2015 but I like the music I don't know why it's just I like that it doesn't rely on bass or any of that and it's very guitar driven and just the voice acting is decent you know it's it's a it's very cliched as far as like the school setting and stuff like that it definitely feels like a 90s movie in a way but so far I've liked what I've played and I like I like point-and-click games 
and the last few years getting into some of the Telltale stuff. This this is probably better than most Telltale games in, in terms of graphics and story. It actually feels like you have big decisions you have to make and it has consequences, but you can also rewind it in order to p see how things go in certain other situations. And one of the other things I liked was the uh, photo thing, because you can take photos in the game and it's similar to Dead Rising a little bit, but but not much, but I just like that you can take photos. It's just something that, that you don't really see in games, but otherwise, I mean, very solid game so far. Can't wait to go through the fourth episode and see what kind of twists they have and finish it up with the fifth one, fifth episode. So I guess I'll move on to the movies, which this past weekend was the uh, Avengers movie that came out Friday. And I'm not really into that stuff, so I'll just be quick about it on this. But it made over $350 million. Let me rephrase that. Let me say that again. $350 million. That's got to be like the biggest weekend ever for any movie. I think probably even did, it did probably much bigger than I think the seventh episode of uh, Star Wars. And worldwide is made over a billion dollars. Over a billion. And I think the way it looks like, it looks like it's set up to be like the big finale in a way. And this is one of the probably one of the last big ones they'll have before they start uh, bringing in stuff like X-Men and stuff like that because with Disney now in control of Fox properties and stuff like that which my personal take I, I think it was just an excuse for them to get X-Men and all the other mutants just my personal thought on it but regardless um, I see them trying to connect everything together with the X-Men and stuff like that. I'll be curious. I'm not, like I said, I'm not really into Marvel stuff. And to be honest, I'm not really the hugest comic book fan because it just, they just, most of the modern stuff just boring. just looks like it'd be boring drivel. Except for maybe like the Deadpool movies, which they, just, they let loose with the character and all that. And they look funny, but also outrageous over-the-top stuff, which I'll be curious to see if they'll reboot that at all. They say they're not, but I would hate to see a reboot of that and and be downgraded to Disney-tier drivel. But anyway, um, which, speaking of which, there I read this, and it's about two services that are looking to come out in the next year or two, and that is Disney Plus and... Um, the NBC Universal app or streaming app. So, as most people are aware, the biggest streaming sites is Netflix and Hulu. These these have been around for a long time. I mean, Netflix has been around for about over 20 years, and uh, Hulu has been around. I can't really remember. Probably the last 12 years or so. I can't remember. I remember Hulu in the early 2010s because you were able to watch anything you wanted. And they had ep access to episodes like The Simpsons, Saturday Night Live, tons of stuff, and even movies, depending on what they wanted for free. I remember in 2011 being able to watch Black Sheep with Chris Farley for free. Like It, it was like you could watch whatever you want. No, no issues or any of that stuff. And this was before they became a pay-to-watch type of thing. And both both these uh, sites have been huge in the last seven, eight years. Tons of tons of stuff that they've acquired over the over their time. Plenty of original projects. And I could see this with NBC and Disney. I see this being the time where they are looking to have their own services and it could bring out a steady stream of competition because one of the things with Netflix and uh, Hulu is that a number of their stuff is acquired is acquired properties like they paid like Netflix they paid a ton of money just to get friends on there now to keep in mind 
at the time they made that deal, the show was 20 years old. But it's still one of the biggest shows of the uh, 90s and still current time. I think people just like it for how the friends are and just the various relationship stuff. But Seinfeld's much better, in my opinion. But anyway, uh, Netflix and Hulu are going to lose a lot if a number of their properties that they acquired are going to go to some of these sites. Now, with Disney, they have along with Fox, Lucasfilm, and Marvel, and Pixar, they have access to thousands of projects, thousands of movies and TV shows that they could put on at any time on their services. And from what I heard of the price, it seemed like it would be decent as far as getting what you want. I'm not sure if it's a monthly thing or if, if it combines all together for a year or so, but... It seems like it'll be a decent price. The question is, how much of the stuff will actually be on there? And how much are they willing to put onto the service? I think if I'm Disney, I would start getting some of the biggest names on not on Disney, Pixar, Fox, Marvel, and Lucasfilm. I think if you're the Marvel stuff, you get you get you get all their stuff on there immediately. At least the ones that that aren't in theaters. And then I would try and get... I think as a way to promote some... If they have sequels for some of their movies. Like, like say, if it came out today, I would have the Toy Story movies on the service before Toy Story 4 comes out, for example. And I, I, I just see this as a way of... I mean, it's... I don't know. I, I view it as like you get some. You start off slow and give off like a number of your popular stuff, and then you you get together more popular stuff, and then go a little bit into it's obscure stuff that maybe people might enjoy, and and see how it pans out. And if it it's not a huge hit, then it just goes like it was into obscurity. Now the universal thing. NBC Universal thing. I, I'm a little curious because how much of it is going to be NBC owned, and if they own them completely, like, like for example, NBC Productions was involved in stuff for a long time before being bought by Comcast and Universal. So, would something like a Fresh Prince be on there? I don't know because it's owned by Warner Brothers, the Fresh Prince. And the same could apply to a number of other shows that appeared on NBC over the years. Now, as far as Universal stuff, I mean, Universal has had a number of their projects and shows on various networks over the years. So it's a matter of, I think, what they've done. But I think, I think they're able to put up a lot more shows than anything that NBC made on their own and and NBC with other production companies that weren't universal. Because, I, I mean, surely, I mean, I would think as far as NBC Universal streaming, you get stuff like the Law & Order shows, uh, probably the Chicago shows, I would assume. It, I, I don't know if they're owned by Universal or not. I think they are, but stuff like The Office. I mean, anything from like 2004 and up, I mean, is a surefire chance to get it on there. And really anything I'd say from NBC during that time too, as long as it wasn't produced by like say Fox or uh, or Warner Brothers or any of that, or Columbia. I, I mean, it's got a tougher hill to climb compared to Disney. But I have no doubt in my mind that NBC Universal will do fine with streaming, and The Office is actually one of Netflix's biggest shows for streaming right now, and to lose that, that's going to be a huge blow. Now, I don't think it's going to make Netflix fail, but I think when you lose access to those acquired shows, and from what I read, The Office isn't set to leave Netflix until 2021, so... I think Netflix 
with the amount of original shows they have, I think it's enough to keep going, but it's a matter of how much the decline will be when the uh, when they start losing some of these acquired shows and it goes to some of the streaming sites. That will be the big question mark in a couple of years. But there's nothing we can see yet, so we'll just have to wait and see how things go because, I mean, right now, I mean, these are just ideas that for release dates, I think Disney is set to come out next year with the Disney Plus app and NBC Universal either next year or in 2021. 20, I, I don't... So, the only other big thing I really have to discuss is the NFL draft, which I'll discuss mainly the uh, first round in general. And there were a lot of defensive guys that were needed, and I don't blame them. I mean, there's a lot of issues with teams on defense, and I think for them to address that, because, I mean, a lot of the teams, they have decent offenses. I mean, they're, some of them have some good abilities to run the ball. De quarterbacks that have some good arm strength to show off against opposing defenses. I mean, some interesting offense choices, like Detroit getting another tight end. It's, I mean, that's one of their big things. It's like they love those tight ends in the first round. One of the biggest stunners is the uh, New York Giants selecting Daniel Jones, six overall pick, which I think a lot of people are a little pissed about. But I mean, from what my from what my dad told me, I mean, he was pissed when when that pick happened. But uh, he's he's calmed down a little bit the last few days, and he thinks it's not a horrible pick, and it's one of those things that's like. This is one of those picks that you have to wait three, four years to understand whether he became a he becomes a bust or not, or if he's one of the great quarterback choices that they make. I don't know. From what my dad told me, he said something along the lines like he he was Jones was part of like the Manning Passing Academy, worked with a coach that played that coached for both Mannings and I mean, the guy could have the capabilities of being Peyton and Eli. He literally could. But it's one of the toughest divisions in the NFL, the NFC East. And it's going to be interesting with all these young quarterbacks, two newcomers in Washington and New York, along with some of these veterans of the last three, four years with Carson Wentz and Dak Prescott. It should be in a couple of years if things, if things are good for all four teams. Should be good enough to uh, be one of the toughest divisions in all of the league. But uh, overall, I mean, not much really to say. I mean, but Kyle, Kyler Murray going to uh, Arizona, that wasn't really much of a surprise. Although Josh Rosen did get traded to Miami. I think that helps Miami a lot more than people realize. Because Fitzpatrick, for whatever teams he's been involved the last the last 15 years or so, I mean, he's not horrible, but he has those inconsistencies. You know, he'll have probably one of the greatest games of his career and then throw a dud a week or two later. That's been his main issue going back to his days in Buffalo. He just can't stay consistent, and he's piled up an okay career, but it's not anything noteworthy. I mean, his best year was 2015, and he threw the Jets' season away. They had the ultimate chance to make the playoffs and throw in three costly interceptions for a 10-6 team that, may, that didn't go to the playoffs. That's bad. But regardless, I mean, Rosen could be their future, I mean. As far as Miami goes, they haven't really had anybody since Marino. That's a shame because they got they've had decent quarterbacks over the years, and I thought Tannehill was going to be their future, but nope. So I don't know what to tell you. It's 2019 is going to be an interesting year for the NFL, depending on the the teams in question and how well teams like Arizona do with some of their new picks. Ugh, man. 
can't believe it. Half hour already in. But not much else really to say. I mean, some baseball. I mean, it's, it's the start of it's the first month of the year for baseball, and it's not too surprising how some great players are. And seeing the home run battle between Christian Yelich and uh, Cody Bellinger, I think that's going to be one of the best duels for the National League. Yelich for Milwaukee and the Dodgers Bellinger. I mean, one of those two is going to go for the MVP. Could Yelich win it for a second time in a row? Or can Bellinger get it? <laughs> um, the AL, I mean, it's a surprise Boston struggling. But you got also got, you know, Houston in the mix doing decently now. The Yankees have piled up some big wins despite a number of injuries. Tampa Bay, who was coming off a strong year last year, looking to be the team to beat in the American League. The Central's still being kind of a weak division, but ultimately, I mean, Cleveland and Minnesota could be the teams to beat in that division. I'll be curious to see how well Seattle does after starting off the season strong, and if it's for real or if it's a fluke, whether they make the playoffs for the first time since 2001 or not. Who knows? So with that, I should end this episode of Geeks and Jocks. This has been episode 15, and in two weeks will be the last episode for a while, and I'll explain more at the end of that episode when we get to it. So, this has been Geeks and Jocks. Hope to see you guys on the next podcast, and have yourselves a nice day.